My dog has a death wish, a suicide pact with chocolate that didn't take into account his cast iron stomach. I thank the God who watches over small dogs for giving her fragile son such a strong constitution and for making him part cat that he has nine lives to move through before he passes from this earthly plane. A recap, life number one, Hercules versus Lindt chocolate. Straight from Europe, before it was even available here. Hercules for the win, but the mess was spectacular. <laughs> Think Jackson Pollock in monochromatic brown. Life number two, a terrifying bout with an unpronounceable virus that stripped the lining from his stomach. For three days, his life hung in a delicate balance from a disease we couldn't wrap our mouths or minds around. Life number three, Herc versus Chocolate, round two. Nothing but a blip on his radar and proof that there is at least one drawback to living fully in the moment, and that is that it's impossible to learn from your mistakes. <laughs> Life number four, Hercules versus Chocolate, round three. Halloween candy this time. The wrappers seemed to bother him more than the chocolate. I'll let you use your imagination on this one. Life number five, a second bout with the same unpronounceable disease that is so very rare that he manages to catch it twice in four years. Really, it's rare. Life number six, Hercules makes a mad dash for freedom into the dense woods around our house with his leash on. Lost for three days, we were sure he'd been killed by a fisher cat. My daughter never gave up hope, and when the police called to tell us he'd been found by a logger tangled in the underbrush in the dense wood, she said, I told you so. We were so happy she was right. Herc versus Chocolate, round four, life number seven. The bar of chocolate meant for Julia winds up in his belly. Here we go again. At least now we know the drill. Life number eight, you'd think We'd know better by round five with the damn chocolate. Mm -hmm. But in our defense, he wasn't supposed to be upstairs, in my bedroom, on my husband's nightstand, chowing down on Trader Joe's finest dark chocolate. Really, dude, you never learn. Life number nine, just a couple weeks ago, chocolate, round six. Brownies again, this time in my handbag, which is zippered closed and on a shelf. Freaking Houdini. That's it. Chocolate is now banned from the house forever. My dog has a death wish. Suicide by chocolate, foiled by his cast iron stomach again. The Grim Reaper, thwarted, circles round but can't settle his score. Please, sir. Enough of this drama. Can't you just take him peacefully as he sleeps? Just not yet. <laughs>
where once was clean and crystal dirty snow dirty snow we are now sheltering a mystery of what uh, will be revealed when springtime breezes blow and melt away those mounds of dirty snow a broken side view mirror a crumpled cardboard tray a bicycle half buried a mitten gone astray here's a handbill for a concert cancelled by a blizzard and something i don't recognize maybe it's a lizard and canine corporal lights to keep me careful where my feet go as i walk the streets of town past mounds of dirty snow dirty snow dirty snow where once was clean and crystal dirty snow dirty snow now sheltering a mystery of what will be revealed when springtime breezes blow and melt away those mounds of dirty snow wander past detritus of winter in the city contemplate the substance the volume the variety that stimulates the senses visual and our factory but looking past the grime and garbage is one thing i know there are daffodils and crocus beneath the dirty snow dirty snow dirty snow where once was clean and crystal dirty snow dirty snow now sheltering a mystery of what will be revealed when springtime breezes blow and melt away mounds of dirty snow melt away those mounds of oh, dirty, dirty snow, snow. <laughs> people say that Colin is very lucky to be with me I don't believe he is lucky at all I believe that 12.04 a.m. April 18th, 2009, he was shot right through his heart when his mom died. But the shot didn't kill him. It killed his spirit, his enthusiasm, his motivation, his love of life. He told me long ago that he stopped caring when he heard his mom was dying in February of 2009. Although she fought and beat other medical issues in their 13 years together, it was cigarettes that took her life. Colin and I continually pressured her not to smoke, and she wanted desperately to stop, but she couldn't. So who do you blame for being plucked out of your home, your neighborhood, leaving your friends, your teammates, your coaches, your favorite guitar teacher, and your belongings? The person who gave you the biggest bedroom so you could invite your friends to play? The person who walked from her office to your school to attend musicals? The person who made sure you had good food, clean clothes, medical checkups, and birthday parties? The person who was there for you 24 hours a day? The person who walked with you, you and Kobe, the dog, every night? Who do you blame for having to move from comfy, warm weather to bitter cold? The person who protected you from being hit during domestic confrontations? The person who stood helpless, shaking, as she watched the police push her toddler, kicking and screaming 
into the father's car for a day visit. Who do you blame for losing your sustaining beam that held you together? April 18th, 2012.06 a.m. Cliff, Pat, and I went into Colin's room to tell him his mom had taken her last breath. We sat on the floor and hugged one another. 12.10 a.m. Colin said, we need to call people. Who, we asked. We need to call the rest of the family. Without missing a beat, he picked up his phone and called his aunts in Massachusetts to tell them the news. He answered their questions as to how we were all doing and then said goodbye. I believe that was the moment that he put his broken heart into an envelope and put it away. And he silently told his mom, it's okay, mom. I can take care of myself. When you're 13 and you have very little experience on which to draw, how do you express so much pain? She's not here. She can't hear you. But there are people that hear you, that are near you. When your anger explodes and you say how much you hate me and our whole family, your words are so powerful and so hateful, there is no other interpretation than to believe that you are screaming at your mom, why did you leave me? Thank you. The water was crystal clear. I marveled at the fact that I could drop a quarter to the depth of a few feet and still read the date on the coin. I remember being told as a youngster that this lake was the second cleanest lake in the world. The cleanest is in Europe somewhere. Our lake was called Newfound Lake and it was in Bristol, New Hampshire. It was seven miles long and maybe two miles wide with some sizable islands. Its deepest point was said to be 250 feet. Surrounded by low mountains painted deep green, Newfound Lake was as beautiful a place as any place on earth. I was sure of that. How lucky my family was to be up in the mountains in New Hampshire. My father stayed for only a few weeks. My mother and my brother and I stayed most of the summer. We stayed in what the military would call a hooch. We call them camps. They had wooden floors, wooden up to three feet high on the sides, and then screens from there up with a canvas roof. When it rained, it was music to my ears. The camp was just 20 feet from the water and we had a fireplace to sit around after supper, listen to many stories told. Sometimes somebody would play the guitar. The camps were basically two rooms, one for sleeping, and one was a kitchen. The kitchen served as the gathering room for card games after the kids went to bed. The sleeping area consists of two double bunks, two singles in the kitchen for the adults, and we were separated only by a curtain. We had electricity running water, but had to go to the well to get drinking water. We followed a neat path through the woods crossed a cute little footbridge and then over a little mountain stream. We used to have to pour water down the throat of the pump to prime it. We would fill five gallon wa uh, milk bottles and that was one of our chores. Well, the days were an adventure, swimming, canoeing, hiking, simply having a great time. Blue skies, warm sun, clean air. It was so beautiful I never wanted to see it change in any way. I wanted it to be frozen in time, but time does, does change things. Today, today the camps have made way for condos. I still go there and it's still beautiful, but beneath my sunglasses are silent tears because it's not preserved for me. Thank you. I walked into the waters of the river today Looking for a way to cool myself down I held my head under as long as I could take Until I felt my chest burning 
and I felt my heartache. The sky was so blue and everything was so still. I heard no birds, no breeze, no nothing but my thoughts of you. I held my head high as long as I could, and suddenly I broke free, and then I understood. I want the wind to blow all my blues away. I want the light to make colors out of gray. I want to ride my thoughts clear up to the sky, turning dark into the day. Then I'll fly away. I remember the last time that I saw you. I heard you, I heard your sweet voice. You said you never wanted to hurt me, but you never, you never really had any choice. I want the wind to blow all my blues away. I want the light to make colors out of gray. I want to ride my thoughts clear up to the sky, turning dark into the day. Then I'll fly away. Then I'll sail away. I want the light to make colors out of gray. I want to ride my thoughts clear up to the sky, turning dark into the day. Then I'll fly away. I know that every day has battles to be fought. There can be lessons to be learned and lessons to be taught. I know that there is always more than we can see. Things sometimes better, sometimes worse, and sometimes even harmony. I want the wind to blow all my blues away. I want the light to make colors out of gray. I want to ride my thoughts clear up to the sky, turning dark into the day. Then I'll sail away, then I'll fly away, then I'll sail away, then I'll fly away. Thank you very much. Thank you. Radical Hypothesis. Ticking. I wrote a book about that, you know, a novel, a work of fiction. But ticking is true. The clock doesn't stop. The clock never stops. Time slips by, fast or slow, that doesn't matter. When gone, it's gone. And it's always gone. Never to return. Never to grant second chances. That requires a new dime never the old one. I'm a time management consultant, it's true. And I counsel my clients to focus. Focus on what is truly important, what truly makes a difference, makes a difference to what they truly value. Do we? Do we focus on what we truly value? No. And we'll never have that time again. The future grows in turmoil and pain. The future sinks in profit and greed. The future writhes in a world gone amuck. The future is home to despair and suffering. The future grabs us into straitjackets that make our present seem like a resort. Is it too late? Is our present already too late? 
A voice deep within says no. A voice deep within cries out no. But that voice has no power. No power to sway the course. No power to create a more de decent future. No power to change the powers that be. And so we stand upon a wayward ship, a ship committed to its rogue ways, a ship steering into a sea of icebergs, its captains with donned blinders swatting the voices of sanity as flies, or worse, joining their voices while staying their hands and steering toward danger anyway. What I wonder as I see the clock tick away is will we ever wake up and change our ways? Will we ever recognize our future and even try, really try, to prevent its dangers? If so, when? How long will it take? And no, we aren't there yet. And when we do wake up, will it be too late? Thank you. Bone Woman sits in the rocking chair at the corner of the old porch, gives me a sly look and then a broad wink. No one escapes the journey to bones. We all die and pass over, and then our bones sink deep into the ground of the burial plot beginning eternal sleep. All of us are born and all of us die. That is the ticket of this particular ride. Long after the mourners leave and the granite headstone reads, here lies so-and-so. Long after the grass grows up, the obituary crumpled to dust, and the descendants themselves old and gray, Bone Woman still sits in the corner and has this to say. Be kind, kinder, kindest, share what you know, greet others openly and give everything a go. Take every adventure that is given to you. And when the hits the fan, you do what you must do. Bone Woman rocks in the chair on the porch. Life is no picnic, at times it does scorch. You are tired and burnt and worn to the bone. And you know, you just end up under a stone. Thank you. Every revolution needs fresh poems. That is the reason poetry cannot die. It is the reason poets go without sleep, and sometimes without lovers, without new cars, and without fine clothes. The reason we commit to facing the dark and resign ourselves regularly to the possibility of being wrong. Poetry is leading us. It never cares how we will be held by lovers or drive fast or look good in the moment, but about how completely we are committed to movement, both inner and outer, and devoted to transformation and to change. Back in 1933, Procter and Gamble made history. They'd give away a thousand dollars free. And the letters sailed and the postcards flew from everywhere you ever knew. And not so far from the Staten Island Zoo was the dump that they all ended up in except for some lucky Belarusian. All those stamps had gone to waste from every known and foreign place. Just across the Arthur Kill, where the ferry stopped and the tankers filled, was a gang of very enterprising children who knew a man from Elizabethtown who'd buy those stamps half penny a pound if they could only figure out some way around. Oh, the Arthur Kill was swift and wide. The ferry cost too much to ride. So they'd grab a hat box from the hall and learn to do the one-arm crawl. 
Swim, Anthony, swim. Hold your hand up high. Swim, Anthony, swim. Keep those postage stamps dry. Swim, Anthony, swim. You gotta beat the tide. Swim, Anthony, swim. Dad and Mom, they both passed on. Felt like an orphan for so long. I, I miss their smiling eyes, reassuring voices. And as I swim my way across this life, as best I can, I try to rise above the wakes of greed, the waves of choices. And there's this one story I've been told that helps me hold my heart, my soul up high against the undertow. I think I hear, I think I see my father swimming next to me. Swim, Anthony, swim. Hold your hand up high. Swim, Anthony, swim. Keep those postage stamps dry. Swim, Anthony, swim. You gotta beat the tide. Swim, Anthony, swim. Thank you. Camille Breeze. <laughs>